whenever we seek you. We thank you for the words of that song, that you are a fortress and that you are unshakable. Lord God, I pray that you would bless us this morning as we open your word. I pray that it would be your word, not mine, that I would disappear from this and that you would just um, show yourself through what you have uh, had me speak this morning. In this we pray, amen. So welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anthony Warman. I am someone who tends here and I've spoken a number of times. I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning, whether it's here in person or online. I find it really interesting how God always has a plan, how he always knows what he's doing. I was asked if I would preach many months ago. I had no knowledge or foresight of what was going to happen in our church or what was going to happen in our world. And it's interesting to me how God brought what I'm going to preach about today. When I, when I started thinking about Psalms and, and preaching on Psalms, I found myself thinking about quite a number. And, you know, it was hard to sort of take and pare that down. I, I, I teased Tyler Brown when uh, he was going to preach here a couple of weeks ago. I said, you know what? You should just pick Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. It'll take full 30 minutes just to read it. He missed his opportunity. So here we go. 100, Psalm 119. <laughs> Kidding. Actually, God brought me back to Psalm 46 again and again. And as we study this morning, we're going to see how God and who God is in times of trouble, in, in times of uncertainty, in times where our whole world seems to be in upheaval. And even as in this, this psalm, even to the point of total and complete destruction. This isn't something that any of us can relate to, is it? We, we live in times of certainty, don't we? We're completely free from trouble. How about the last two years? That was really certain, wasn't it? All those never changing rules, that was pretty certain. How about gas prices? Those are certain, aren't they? Well, yeah, maybe they are, they're high. So that's pretty certain. But how about your ability to pay for it? Is that certain? What about the war in Ukraine? Is that certain? Jonathan, uh, Pastor Jonathan alluded to it today as well. We've had quite a lot of tragedy and loss in this church recently. All those were expected, were they not? All that is certain, was it not? We're free from trouble in those things, are we not? It's interesting that it's Psalms that we turn to in times of trouble. And I think there's a real reason for that. It's, it's something that we, we turn to when there's difficulty, when we're in distress, or when we need comfort. I, I was listening to David Jeremiah, and he's a, a pastor online that uh, I listen to occasionally, and, and he said this about the Psalms, and it's certainly true of our Psalm today. They are the words to describe what we are feeling. And in some sense, we find our story written before it ever occurs. Isn't that interesting? We're reading our own life expression. We're reading our own distress. We're reading our own comfort, need for comfort. It's the Psalms are that emotional expression of human existence with all of its pain and all of its praise. And it's already written down here. So when we don't know how to express it or where to go, it's here. I know this is true for me. Oftentimes I come to the Psalms when we struggle or in times of difficulty. And it doesn't even have to be real trouble. It could just be the heaviness of our lives. We did a, a whole series on Job here not that long ago. 
And uh, Job is a very heavy book, as you know. Anyone who is here, it's a very heavy book. I found for myself, I had to read Psalms right along Job. So I couldn't just read Job by itself. I had to go back to the Psalms. So I would ask that you stand with me and join me as we read uh, Psalm 46. And it is on page 486 in the Blue Bible, if you would like to turn there. Psalm 46. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy place where the Most High dwells. God is with her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Have a seat. So this psalm, it's, I'll I'll give you some, we're going to do some background and then we'll get into some of the points of this. It's, it's helpful, I think, for me to understand some of the context and background, and maybe it is for you as well. This psalm was written to the whole people of Judah. This is a congregational song or psalm for God's people. This isn't an individual song some, or psalm, just sometimes like we see what David would write. David would write, I am, or I am, I'm seeking you, God. This is a congregational song. So this is one that we can use individually, that we can, can um, use for our own self. And in fact, uh, Jeff DeHaan reminded me this morning that this was one that he learned as a young man, that he memorized. This is actually a very good psalm to memorize the whole thing. It's not very long, but it's a good one to memorize and have in our hearts. So it's one that we can use individually, but it's also one that is the hope and strength of us as a congregation, the whole group of us collectively. You you see it separated there in a a few parts. Um, As with many parts of the Bible, this psalm is circular thinking where Ideas and parts give different perspectives to the same theme. And fundamentally for us today, this psalm will answer the question of who is God in times of trouble? This chapter is broken into three parts. The, second, the, the sections are separated by the word selah, which we don't necessarily know the specific meaning, but in our case, we can think of it as a pause. It's, it could be a, a note to the choir master. It could be an amen. It could be a pause. In this case, it pauses us to reflect on each section. For some context for us of what is happening, because this is a congregational psalm, we need to know a little bit about what was happening for God's people when it was written. If you want to read more about what was happening, I'll I'll leave that to you yourselves. You can do that. You can see, uh, if you want to ask me later, I'll just tell you where it is now quickly. Uh, You can read about the history of this in 2 Kings 18 and 19, uh, 2 Chronicles 32, and Isaiah 36 and 37. 
Um, it is believed that this psalm was written during the reign of King Hezekiah of Judah. So you can see the kingdom of Judah on the bottom there, and then the kingdom of Israel uh, above it. So in David and Solomon's time, that was one kingdom. After Solomon, it became two kingdoms, the northern and southern kingdom. So this was written when Hezekiah was king of the king of, kingdom of Judah. It's about 701 BC. The northern kingdom of Israel is actually doesn't exist anymore. Uh, that, that kingdom had already been conquered by um, the Assyrian Empire. It had disappeared. So for the kingdom of Judah, all of their family, former families, has gone. And at this time, we have King Sennacherib, king of the Assyrian Empire, and he's put Jerusalem under siege. So he, we have the northern kingdom is gone, and the kingdom of Judah is now under siege. And essentially, all that is protecting this kingdom and Hezekiah and his kingdom is the fortress walls of Jerusalem and the spiritual favor that God has towards his people. This is a time when God's people were facing the total destruction of their world and their worldview. So they are at a point where this is the end. This is the destruction of the, the world for them. And it's funny how this psalm was written for this time, but it is also one that was used by Christians throughout history. This is the psalm that we get uh, a famous hymn. Um, Protestant reformer Martin Luther, if you've heard of him, this is the psalm that he wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And we sang a version of a similar song. And without getting into too much of a history lesson, during the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, Martin Luther and his fellow reformers were challenging the power and the position of the Catholic Church. And through the struggles and the hardship and the ostracism that they faced, they turned to Psalm 46 and would often say to each other, come, let's sing Psalm 46. So who is God in times of trouble? We can go back to this one. In the first section in verses one to three, it establishes who God is and where our trust should be. You can see it there in the first verse. God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. God is our refuge. A refuge can be a person. We can run to a person for refuge. Uh, in Psalm 91, verse 4, I believe it is, uh, it talks about how the shelter of God's wings. So the refuge could be like that mother hen and her chicks. You run to the shelter of the wings. It can also be a place that pro provides that shelter and protection from danger that we have. I'll tell you a story about myself where I sought out shelter. When I was a, a young child, probably the age of my children now, eight to 10, uh, I was at my grandparents' farm and we were having sort of a family reunion type event and there was a dog there and uh, he wasn't a very nice dog, he was actually borderline vicious. Um, and. I found myself outside in the yard staring at the dog. And I think we both had the same idea. He was going to get me, and I figured he was going to get me. <laughs> so I ran for shelter. I ran for a refuge. And I made it to the house. But the dog got the bottom of my shoe tore the sole of my shoe off, but I made it. It was that all I was doing was seeking shelter and refuge. And that's what God is saying here, that he is our refuge and strength. So when 
trouble comes, retreat to that refuge, to God who is our refuge. Psalm 91, I'm going to use Psalm 91 to help us with Psalm 46. Psalm 91 is helpful because it gives us a glimpse of the type of refuge that God is. First off, God is, is secure and he's that place of rest. That's the thing about a shelter and a refuge. I knew that when I made it to the house, the adrenaline took a while to come down, but I could rest in that place. So Psalm 91 one says that he who shelters, who, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So God is a place of rest. He's a place of protection, but also rest. And one of the things that we need to know about this protection, this rest, is that it is right here, right now. In our, in our main verse, in, or in the first verse of Psalm 46, if we go back there, it says that God is an ever-present help in trouble. The language, and take note of this, the language written here is present tense. It implies right here, right now. It implies a closeness of right here, right now. So it means that ever present in trouble means present. It means God is present. He's already here. He is present, as I've said. We don't have to try and go and find him out there. Or go and call for him out there, pleading, will you come here? He's already present. Some, some translations uh, also say very present. So ever present, meaning always present, or very present, meaning abundantly available for help. So God doesn't run out of resources. He is abundantly available when he is present. The Rabbi Standard Version also translates it sometimes to well-proved help in trouble. Charles Spurgeon, a, a preacher from uh, the 1800s, he says this, God never withdraws himself. He is ageless. God does not change and nothing can change God. There, and then there is security in knowing that. So he is well proved because he doesn't change. Psalm 102 here, as you see it says, in the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hand. They will perish but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like clothing you will change them and they will be discarded, but you will remain the same and your years will never end. God is well proved, he doesn't change. So not only is God present, and abundantly available. He's also proven, meaning that tried and tr tested. Is this not also true of Jesus, his son? Think about it, how Jesus was faithful to the Father, even unto death, on a cross. And that was for our salvation, not that we could do anything, but by the grace of God, we are saved. And then that, and Jesus, who is proven and tested there, he now sits at the right hand of the Father as our mediator. And he has sent the Holy Spirit who is present with us. God is proven and tested and present. God is our refuge and he is also strong and solid. Psalm 91 two there says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. God is solid, secure and strong because he is a fortress. We have a tendency to think about this. 
This is not a fortress. This is a fort. <laughs> this is the latest fort that is in my living room. Uh, as you can see, it is well fortified with its various stuffies and blankets held together by its bulldog clips. The piano acts as the bulwark on the one side, but so does the wall. So there is security in this fort, right? Again, this is not a fortress. We have to think about this. This is Jerusalem, or one of the walls of Jerusalem today. It just gives us an idea of a fortress. If we compare my kid's fort to Jerusalem at the time of Hezekiah, Jerusalem, Jer Jerusalem's walls at that time, the length of the walls was 4,018 meters. It was about 2.4 miles was the length of the walls. Their average height was 12 meters, which is 40 feet. And the average thickness, so you have to think the average thickness was 2.5 meters, which was 8 feet. But they've done some excavation of Hezekiah's walls. There's one part that they have that's about 65 uh, meters long or so that they've excavated, and it's called the broad wall. Those walls are seven meters thick. That's 23 feet. There is no comparison between that fortress and my kid's fort. In the same way, we should really think about God. There's no comparison to God as our fortress and Jerusalem, the city, as a fortress. If we look at Revelations 21, we can see the new Jerusalem as it comes from heaven. And this is, this is just an image of the city. This isn't even God. So this is, doesn't give us who God is as a fortress, but it will show us the uncomparable nature between Jerusalem and the city, the fortress that God will build. In Revelation 21, 16 and 17, the walls are... 1,500 miles long, not 2.4 miles long. And the city is described as those, that distance of wall is a cube. So not only length, but width and height. So that's 2,400 kilometers or 1,500 miles in all directions. And the walls themselves are 200 feet thick. There is no comparison between the fortress that God makes and this. And even that is not a comparison, but it's just a glimpse of the immense fortress that God is. So God, as our refuge, is strong and secure and solid. God is also secure. Psalm 91, five to seven says, you will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. So that fortress is secure. So who is God in times of trouble? He is present, he is proven, he's unchanging and he's secure. So how comforting is it then that when we look back at Psalm 46 and the trouble that we face, that we see how secure the refuge is. As we move through the, the next part of the section, and, and it's okay, the, my last two points are going to be shorter than the first, but as we look at that comfort and that refuge, what follows it are the, the lines that say, you are my strength and my refuge, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the sea, into the heart of the sea. And we know that figuratively, the sea is uh, that illustration for chaos. So it falls into that destruction, complete destruction. But I think there is a bit of a literal meaning here too that we can look at in a second. When they're looking at this, in God's talking in this verse, it is that literally falling into sea, that 
uncreation of the world. And we don't quite understand that, but we can see a few examples of it where it is physically possible. Some of you will recognize the photograph on the top left. That's Mount St. Helens. So the earth will fall into the sea. Naturally, the earth can be destroyed. Naturally. You have to think, Mount St. Helens, um, when it, the, the immensity of that destruction, it took six years for the ecosystem around Mount St. Helens to recover. Ash from that fallout traveled around the world uh, in trace amounts. And most of it up to about anywhere from five or six inches of ash or more to uh, like half an inch of ash covered most of the western part of the United States. So the world is uncreated. We do it to ourselves as well. And you can read in a lot of the rest of the Psalms, it talks, it's, talks about war. Uh, the second picture is that's uh, Hawthorne Ridge. That's the mine that was blown on Hawthorne Ridge on the 1st of July, 1916. Uh, that photograph is taken at a half a mile away. So you're, you're in the British lines looking at the German lines. That's half a mile away. That explosion was heard in England. And this was in France. We do it to ourselves too, the total destruction of our world. So God is our refuge. And like I said earlier, the, this chapter gives us some different perspectives. So that second section that we have in verses four to seven, we also discover our strength in God and in the confidence of our resource and the confidence of his resources because he will provide them. There are three things that brought confidence to the people of Judah at the time that this Psalm was written. It's a river, a city, and a holy place. And you, we see those in, in verse five. The city is Jerusalem. And it says that God is within her and she will not fall. That is a good comfort to the people when they're under siege. The holy place that it talks about is the temple, that central place of worship and focus of God's confidence, of Judah's confidence in God. And then there's the river, and this is what I really want to focus in on this, this one section, is the river that is within the city of God. Because water, as we know, is that source of life. Jerusalem, under, Jerusalem doesn't, didn't have a stable source of water, and under siege, uh, if you can cut off a water supply, you can get a city to fall. If, as long as they have water, they will remain. Uh, it's more difficult to capture them. So Hezekiah did some building projects and he was able to bring uh, water into the city through some tunnels so that Jerusalem wouldn't fall that way. But we too can have confidence that God is a source of living water for us. But the interesting thing is for us is that we need to look at it from the New Testament backwards. Because Jesus is our living water. And when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman there in John 4, 13 and, 13 and 14, we see this. Jesus answered, anyone who drinks this water, his, will be, or his water, sorry, the, the water that the, the woman was offering to him will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus is our living water, our eternal life. And when we look forward again into Revelation, into Revelation 22, um, the apostle John writes, and then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So the river of life, our source of life, is flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, who is Jesus. It flows down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side, the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its 
fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. The river of life also provides us that abundance of God. The Bible tells us that our salvation, our living water, is through grace alone, through our faith alone in Christ alone. In Psalm 46, our, our last section, our last bit of perspective is, is in verses 8 to 11. And this gives us this last perspective of who God is when we face times of trouble and why we should have confidence in him as our refuge. It, it starts by inviting the audience to see the works of the Lord. Not only will God end all wars in verse 9, so he will end things like we saw. If we look at Psalm 95, we will see how immense his works are. It says, in his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. The immensity of his work. But it's more than that. When trouble comes, the psalm says, calls us to shift our thoughts and our attention. And what's interesting, again, if we look at the language of verse 10, it shifts in language again, where we had a present tense before, the shifts from a third person to a first person, and this is now God talking. Verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. This isn't, be still and know that I'm God. This is, be still and know that I am God. This is the voice of a dad interjecting into fighting children. This is, for those of you who have been in the military, this is your command to stand at attention. Again, this is, in verse 10, it's that, hey, stop what you're doing, stop your fighting, and listen to me. I'm God. And then he says, I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted on the earth. I'll give you a, a little bit of a story that happened to me here, and uh, uh, happened with Kelly Kozak down in G-Force. So I, I, I went down one time to go and uh, pick up my kids, and uh, I'm sure it was a day where there was a little less help than uh, was needed. And uh, you could tell that the kids were starting to get antsy and unruly. And you could tell that because there's the two kids in the back where the one's got the white glue and the other's got the glitter. And they're about to have a meal together. And that crescendo of things that are going on, and as you're just trying to wrap up. And I walked by, and, and I was going to pick up my kids, and so I directed really to my kids. But I said, clean up. It's time to go. Well, the glitter went away. The paste went away. Every kid sat up straight. And they all listened to Mrs. Kozak. God's saying here, be still and know that I am God. So in all this chaos and all the destruction and uncertainty that we have, God is our refuge because he is God. So we need to stop what we're doing, listen, and know that he is God. And from that, we can proclaim the last stanza of this, or the, the refrain of this psalm. And it says, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you 